want to welcome everybody here again. If you haven't already, fill out the uh, communication card and let us know that you're here, particularly if you're here for the first time. Uh, we're always looking forward to make connections with you uh, and those who might be viewing this by uh, YouTube or online. Uh, we are in our series on Proverbs. We're continuing, and I thought because of Valentine's Day is this week, why not see what Proverbs says about male and female relationships? How about that? That's what we have it here, right? Male and female all over here. So let's think about that today. So when did things like that start coming into my life? Well, I was in high school and I began to notice girls, right? Um, and, uh, but I never had the courage. I was so shy, I could not say hi to a, a young girl that I, I found attractive. Uh, so I never dated in high school and college. I began to date just a little bit and uh, had a short-term girlfriend. And then, then I met my wife, Cindy. Uh, in college, and uh, after college, we were married. Um, she will tell you that we broke up, I think, twice during that time, uh, painful periods of, of, of time. So we were married in 77. Uh, then we went to Pasadena uh, in 79. I started seminary, graduate school for preachers. Beginning that, uh, we had our first child, the first semester of seminary. That's not what we planned. We planned the child to come at the end of seminary three years later, you know. That's never happened to you, right? Never, right? <laughs> um, so there I was, a full-time student. She was at home with a brand new baby, uh, uh, separated by distance from relatives. Um, I'm working every night from 6 to 10, four nights a week. And when I am home, I'm studying, right? Greek and other wonderful things. And so we began to have some relational issues. And so our school had a psych department and they offered free counseling services. And so we took ourselves to there and we sat to uh, and have marriage counseling. Here we've been married, what, two years? And we're having trouble. And uh, so we went through, I don't know how many sessions, but I will never forget the session where the female counselor looked at us and referenced a book called Risk and Chance in Marriage by Bernard Harnick and got this drawing and showed us the six pillars of a relationship. And there we were. She explained each of those six pillars. And then she looked at us and says, every one of your pillars has cracks in it. <laughs> yeah. That was very sobering. We had work to do. Very much work to do. And so uh, we've worked at it now for 40 years. 40 years. Not a day goes by in the media that the male and female relationship isn't in the news these days. All this sexual misconduct, every day it seems like somebody's uh, misconduct in relationship is happening. There's the, the divorces by the stars and, oh, we got the wedding coming up, the royal wedding, right? Uh, Prince Harry got engaged and so that'll all be the rage. But everywhere you look, uh, male and female relationships are happening. And uh, this week is the week in which we celebrate the male and female relationship in America by celebrating Valentine's Day. Now, most of us heard that um, Half of all marriages end in divorce. That's the typical statistic that you hear. And unfortunately, that is a statistic that they say is true even in the church. But here's the latest on divorce. It is according to the National Center for Marriage and Research, fam marriage research is that divorce rates are down. They are the lowest they've been in 40 years. In 1980, there were 23 divorces for every 1,000 women. Today, there are 16.9 divorces for every 1,000 married women. So divorce is down. But to balance that out, marriages are also down. In 1970, there were 77 marriages for every 1,000. Today, there are 32 marriages per 1,000 unmarried women. So the marriage rate has gone down as well as the divorce rate, except in one area, the baby boom generation. The divorce rate for men and women over 50 is twice the national average. And for those over 65, it's triple. So what does that tell you? 
that the older you get, the less you know about man and female relationships. <laughs> you, you think that you would learn how to make this work, but it shows us that we really don't learn very much. In fact, the older most of us are, are, are failing at maintaining those male and female relationships. I thought that was kind of interesting. So let's look at the scripture today. Let's look at Proverbs. What does it say about male and female relationships? And again, we have to look at the audience. Who was Proverbs written to? What was this book used for? It was to teach young men who were of royalty, of affluent families who were in training, being groomed to take a position in Israel's government. And who is the author of Proverbs? Men, <laughs> okay. So it is biased in that direction. Uh, particularly kings. There's three kings mentioned, Agur and Lemuel, and of course, King Solomon. All wrote Proverbs here today. We'll be looking at those today. Now, you know King Solomon. He is known for writing over 3,000 Proverbs. He is known for his tremendous wealth. He is known for his, uh, his wisdom, right? But he's also known for having 700 wives. <laughs> and 300 concubines, okay? Uh, that's a thousand women in his life. So I think he has something to say uh, about the male and female relationship. So let's look at the male relationship, uh, uh, female instructions here in Proverbs. Again, uh, it, it is heavily weighted in that direction. The first lesson is to highly value women. And it lands in the last chapter of the Proverbs 31 chapter, the epilogue of the book of Proverbs, where it writes, A woman, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. King Solomon did not write this proverb. King Lemuel wrote it. And it says in the first verse of this chapter, it says that this is an oracle by King Lemuel that was taught to him by his mother. So here you have a mother's counsel to her son who is now the king about how to treat a woman and what kind of woman to look for. So a noble woman, who can find? King Lemuel, she is rare. She is worth looking for diligently. The word noble is a wonderful, large, inclusive term. It means to be strong, resourceful, to be of, of moral character and have abundant capabilities. This is the kind of woman that is worth more than rubies. Again, you know that precious gemstone, one of the most beautiful gemstones made in the world. They're this rich color of red. And, you know, I don't have a ruby. I've never... I don't think my wife owns a ruby. The closest I can get to a ruby is my ruby red truck, I think. So, uh, but it, as a stone, is one of the most valuable and precious stones out there. They have long been a symbol of wealth and power, and kings have them in their crowns, and any monarch would have rubies in their set of crown jewels. So it is the most precious object that you can imagine that the woman is being compared to today. But here's the thing that is, is spot, is that she is more important than a thing. She is more important than a possession. She is more important than any object. That's the point here. Think of the most valuable thing, and the woman is above that because she's not an object. She's not a possession. And that was the culture of the day, right? All through the Old Testament, children, animals, servants, and women were possessions of men. How contrary then is this Proverbs 31? No, a woman is not a thing, not an object. She's above that and she is to be valued with the same dignity and worth because she too is in the image of God. This is repeated in 1914. Houses and wealth are inherited from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Here the young man is again reminded that she's not an object like houses or money. She is a gift from God. Takes us back to Genesis, right? God created Adam. Adam, you're good. Oh, no, something is not good about you. You're alone. Let me create a helper suitable for you. 
And then he saw her and goes, whoa, man. <laughs> this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is my uh, compliment, my perfect human compliment, also made in the image of God. A woman is a gift from God. Proverbs 12, 4 says, A wife of noble character is her husband's crown. But a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. And so here is the image. She is a, a crown. She is to be elevated, protected, and, and treated with honor and respect. She brings a sense of royalty into the relationship. She is not a carpet to be tread upon or to be abused. She is a crown to be honored and to be recognized. This high view of woman is the, the foundation of everything else that will be said in Proverbs. That's the number one thing, is to look at the female as highly valued, more highly than any thing. She's not a thing. Secondly, look for a woman of character. All through the Proverbs, there's these statements about character, and the most complete statement of a woman's character is here in Proverbs 31. And I brought my message Bible, because it's a contemporary translation of Proverbs 31. So let me just read it for us. Typically, you hear this read on when? Mother's Day. I'm going to read it today. It says, a good woman is hard to find and worth far more than uh, diamonds, rubies. Her husband trusts in her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all of her life. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field. She buys it with the money. She puts it aside and plants a garden. The first thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work, is, no in, hurry, no, is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent in homemaking. She is quick to assist anyone in need and reaches out to help the poor. Her clothes are well made and elegant, and she always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say, and she always says it with kindness. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you, you have outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades, but a woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Celebrate her life with praises. And so if you take all of those verses and you summarize them like I have, this woman is trustworthy. She's hardworking. She's enterprising. She's compassionate. She's nurturing. She's dignified. She's strong. She's optimistic. She has a sense of humor. She's wise in her instruction, and she is God-fearing. That last trait is so very, very important. Um, as I had mentioned, our counseling times as, as our marriage went along. And, you know, when I was young, I did, I did not have a list of qualities I was looking for. My list had one thing on it, and it was, I need a woman who shares the same commitment to Christ that I have. That was it. That was, that was the top and non-negotiable. None of those other things. And God gifted me with such a woman. And then I found out all those other qualities came with it. <laughs> but though that counseling session that we had, and we had a few others, we went to counseling. I recommend that. If you've got marriage troubles, go to a counselor. It might help you, but I'm going to tell you here now that it was our commitment to Jesus Christ that made the difference and why I can stand here today and say we've been married 40 years and the years have gotten better as time goes by. That singular commitment to Jesus Christ has made all the difference in our relationship. I can tell you that, no problem. So Proverbs goes on to then use that context because in Israel, most men did get married. Most women did get married. And so, again, the Proverbs have that context in mind. And so, if you find this woman of noble character, then marry her. And I'll tell you, 
Mom, you may or may not remember, but Dad, I was dating Cindy two years. And he pulled me aside and he says, listen, fish or cut bait. You know that statement, right? He says, either put a ring on her finger or let her go. My dad told me, none of this stuff that goes on forever, you know, make up your mind. And if she's the one, then do something about it. And uh, I'll never forget that. So Proverbs, again, stay faithful if you're married. Drink water from your own well. Rejoice in the wife of your. May she satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated with your love. This covenant relationship of love and loyalty is to be the only relationship. You're not stepping outside of it. You're not looking for an affair. You're not going to pornography. You are finding the passion and satisfaction in that relationship of love and loyalty. It is a covenant done before God. So don't mess it up by stepping away from it. Be captivated with her love. Then praise, reward, and honor her. Proverbs 31. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward that she has earned and let her works praise, uh, let her uh, works bring her praise at the city gate. So arise, stand up. It's a, it's a gesture of respect and, and, and tell the public, this woman is, is, is worth everything. She deserves the, the award of the year. Uh, praise her, uh, indicate publicly your unqualified regard for her worth and her uh, accomplishments. Uh, praise this person that God has gifted you with. And so these are the kinds of phrases that are, are spoken to these young men about women in their lives. Before I get to female and male instructions, which there's only just a few, actually, um, I heard a story about this couple who were at a party and they were chatting it up and apparently the subject of marriage counseling came up and the woman says oh well we'll never need marriage counseling ever and somebody said well what why would you be that way you know why would you say that so adamantly she says well because my husband when he went to college got a degree in communication he's an excellent communicator and I got a degree in theatrical arts And so when he communicates, I act like I'm listening. <laughs> One of the few things that I found online to tell you today. <laughs> All right, women, what does Proverbs say to you? Again, um, the context is predominantly male, predominantly in the confines of marriage and family. And uh, so here... And again, women were not often invited into the public sphere for a career. And so where is the woman's greatest influence? Where is the place that her gifts and talents are exercised in the scripture, in the biblical times? Well, is in the home. And so these verses have to speak about how she is in the home. And that's the first lesson. Be a wise builder. Proverbs 14.1 the wise woman builds her house. She is the source of strength and diligence in her family. This is where her abilities and her virtues, this is where her character really shines. This is her domain. We're talk, talking about the physical structure of a house. We're talking about the relational environment of a house. So she is in charge of how the husband and wife and the, the parent relationship with the kids and, and maybe there's grandparents. Again, extended families live together, right? And uh, guests and servants and so forth. This was her domain and this is where her gifts really made a difference. Just think if she is married to a community leader or someone in the, the kingdom government, I mean, what influence she could have on him in that environment. And so this is her domain. Again, in the biblical uh, context, this is what is said. A wise woman builds, cultivates, nurtures the household environment. But then the negative. But with her own hands, the foolish woman tears her house down. And so Proverbs talks about 
the negative actions and words that can actually harm this household and ruin the relationships that she has with her husband or other people in the house. And these I call wrecking ball behavior. So the first one is Proverbs 11:22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Here the word means taste. It implies discernment and accurate perceptions of situations. So no amount of physical beauty is going to make up for a woman who lacks taste or sound or good judgment it's a combination that is repulsive you don't oh you don't have a gold ring in in the nose of a filthy smelly pig they should never be together and that's what it says it doesn't matter how beautiful you are but if you behave and talk in ways that are indiscreet you ruin your relationship you bring embarrassment and shame to your family then another one 21 9 he's again speaking to the men about women better to live in the corner of a roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife or a contentious woman three times this proverb is repeated it means they're they're really trying to get these young guys to think about who they marry and what can result proverbs 27 a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand and so this is again negative behavior it's not that you have an argument every now and again we all have arguments now and again here it refers to a personality that picks fights as a way of life so it's every decision it's every question who what where when how is always a debate it's always a challenge it's always a conflict and and the person never gives in and never gives up like raindrops hitting the bottom of the drain it's just constant 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 and the proverb says you can't stop it so isolate yourself go to the top of the roof and find the corner go to the attic storeroom go go to a place of solitude to get away from it this is a personality trait to avoid on both sides because men can be that way as well then the final wrecking ball for both sides too is sexual promiscuity again as we looked in that message about sexual misconduct in chapters 2 and chapter 5 and chapter 7 it's all about misconduct isn't it the mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit he who is under the Lord's wrath will fall into it again and again and again these young men are warned about a woman who would have loose morals Proverbs 2 wisdom will save you from the adulteress from the wayward wife with her seductive words and again Israelite women were, were protected and they were taught the Ten Commandments about thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not lust or, or covet and so dominantly the, the community enforced those morals and the women followed them but you had foreign women and actually the word adulterer means foreign or strange woman so someone from another nation or another culture comes in and they don't honor the Ten Commandments they were women of loose morals and here the challenge is you know don't be going in that direction in, in that way and as a woman in Israel don't follow their ways because then you will receive that label as well so sexual promiscuity was, was a sin and is a sin and will not go without consequences. Uh, there is, as we see today, as we see today, one act of sexual indiscretion can ruin lives and destroy careers. Uh, full of shame and guilt and, and, and confusion and again, divorce, as we see, happens all because of this kind of misconduct. And so the, the man is warned, but the woman is also warned not to become a woman of loose morals, but, but to hold to the standard of the scriptures. And so what can we learn from all of these things? Again, heavily um, biased toward men and what they need, uh, but again, there's transference here in both directions. So 
I say, first of all, well, be a Proverbs man. Be a, a person who is wise and God-fearing and patient and kind and gentle in speech. Uh, one who is self-controlled in the use of alcohol. There's verses about that. And the use of food and, and the controlling of your temper. You know, all of those are given specifically, those general maximums to men on how you should behave, not just with your woman, but out in the community as well. I recall a, a young man in our uh, church in the 90s. Remember Promise Keepers? Promise Keepers? And uh, late 90s, we took a group of men uh, down to Fresno, to Bulldog Stadium down there. And it was an overnight trip. We had to drive down there and spend the night and come back. And we took this young guy, and his wife let him go. You know, overnight, she's got two kids, so she let him go. And uh, I remember the last evening, the altar call was given, and just hundreds of men were going down to the front. And I was watching him, and sure enough, he gets out of the seat, and he heads down to the front. I'm following him behind, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and he is led to Christ or a rededication to Christ at that time. It was a wonderful moment there for him. So we get back late at night, and we drop him off at his apartment, just right over here, Walnut and Marconi, he lived. And I didn't see him for another week or so, and, and then he tells me, he says, you know, when I got home, my wife met me at the door. <laughs> and here's what she said. She, she just pointed her finger at me, and she says, are you a changed man? <laughs> <laughs> because if you're not, you're not coming in. <laughs> And apparently that was the hope and that was the expectation. Yeah, I'll let you go to Promise Keepers, but you better come back a changed man <laughs> or you're not coming in. And that was the way to start. Again, your commitment to Christ makes the difference. And that's what she needed to see from him. And I, I love that story. And I have lost contact with him, so I hope that he was true to that indication because he said, yes, I am. <laughs> And he went forward in that. So that's what we can do. We, we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. And that's where the focus needs to be in a relationship. Work on your own stuff. Let the other person work on their stuff. Secondly, then, be a Proverbs woman, of course. The 31 is a high ideal, is it not? Again, there's no reference to physical beauty there. It's all about inner character, inner beauty. First Peter talks about that. Cultivate inner beauty, trustworthy, hardworking, enterprising, compassionate, nurturing, dignified, strong, optimistic, instructive, God-fearing, again, the most of, important of all virtues. Uh, these are the challenges of the male and female relationships, is to be the best you can be as created in the image of God and let God work in your relationship one to another. When we talk about church as I'm looking at male and females here of all different ages let us remember 1st Timothy 5 1 where Paul is telling the young pastor Timothy you know appeal to older men as fathers and treat younger men as brothers and older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity that's the kind of relationship we have you know this is a tradition we don't often call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, but the church I grew up in, that's what it was. It was always Brother Reimer, you know, Sister Reimer. That was their introductions to each other in church on Sundays. And this is the mentality we need to have to each other, is that mutual respect for who God made us to be, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, I again thank you for uh, the book of Proverbs and what it speaks to us about. Again, in context, our, our world continues to change. And uh, I am pleased to see that uh, women's equality and uh, value of, of women, as I spoke about in 31, is in fact made a huge step forward in, in this culture, in our world today, in this last year. And, and that is a good thing. That is a biblical movement, I believe. And so we want to thank you for that. Uh, Lord, you know where we need to work. And again, the focus should be upon us. And by your Holy Spirit, you can point out those, those cracks that need to be repaired. And you are the one who can lead us in our marriage relationships or in our own uh, friendships. 
to, to be the kind of people that you want, want us to be. Lord, we open ourselves to that influence today, as always, in Jesus' name. Amen.